Thank you so much for joining us. This is a HeartFlow sponsored SCCT CT Technologist webinar on precision heart care. First off, we have Dr. Sujith Kalathavitol, who's the Director of Advanced Imaging for the Department of Cardiology at Dooley Health and Care. Dooley is one of the largest multi-specialty independent provider groups in the U.S. with more than 1,000 primary care and specialty care physicians. He also serves as Medical Director of Advanced Cardiac Imaging at Advocate Good Samaritan Hospital and Co-Director of Cardiac Imaging at Northwestern Central DuPage Hospital. He has a clinical focus in FFRCT as well as, as structural heart disease imaging. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalatha Vitol, for joining us. Thank you, Tara. So my name is Sudith Kalatha Vitol. I'll be speaking today about coronary CTA and the impact of CT technologists. This is an overview of my presentation. We'll begin with coronary artery disease. We'll then move on to coronary CTA and FFRCT, and then we'll talk about the role of the CT technologist. So let's begin with coronary artery disease. Heart disease remains a leading cause of death for adults worldwide, and coronary artery disease, also known as CAD, is the most common type of heart disease to cause death. CAD occurs when the coronary arteries, which supply blood to the heart, become narrowed by plaque. Plaque is made of cholesterol and calcium. The deposition of plaque is known as atherosclerosis. Coronary artery disease causes death by triggering a myocardial infarction known as an MI, or among lay people as a heart attack. And an MI occurs when a plaque ruptures, causing a blood clot to form that completely obstructs blood flow. Every year, about 805,000 patients in the United States have a myocardial infarction. And MIs kill 360,900 Americans in 2019, one in five of these deaths occurred in patients under the age of 65. And interestingly, during the COVID pandemic, deaths from heart disease actually went up, surpassing deaths from COVID-19. And this is due to a variety of reasons, including avoidance of care, as well as direct effects of COVID-19 infection on the blood vessels. And deaths from coronary artery disease actually rose higher than any other forms of heart disease during the COVID pandemic. So let's move on to coronary CT angiography. Coronary CTA, also known as CCTA, has become the first line test for the diagnosis of coronary artery disease. And this concept came as a result of the Scott Hart study. This study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2018. It consisted of 4,146 patients in Scotland who presented with stable chest pain. And they were randomized to the standard of care, which was a treadmill stress test and medications, or the standard of care with the coronary CTA. And at one year, there was a significant 50% reduction in fatal and non-fatal myocardial infarction in the coronary CTA arm. And this difference persisted at five years. At five years, there was a 41% reduction in death from coronary artery disease and non-fatal myocardial infarction in the coronary CTA arm. And interestingly, this benefit was primarily driven by a reduction in non-fatal MI. A higher number of patients in the coronary CTA arm were initiated on preventative medications compared with the standard of care arm. And that really exposes one of the weaknesses of stress testing. Stress testing cannot detect early coronary artery disease. Coronary CT, on the other hand, excels at detecting early coronary artery disease. But that being said, coronary CTA has some limitations compared to stress testing. It tends to overestimate intermediate grade lesions as well as heavily calcified lesions. And crucially, it does not provide functional data. In other words, it cannot tell if a stenosis is affecting flow. FFRCT overcomes these limitations by providing functional data similar to invasive FFR, which is a technique used in the cath lab. With FFRCT, we can tell if an intermediate grade lesion is hemodynamically significant. We can also read through heavily calcified lesions. So FFRCT really enhances the specificity of coronary CTA. So these are the 2021 AHA ACC chest pain guidelines, which were released largely in response to the growing data on coronary CTA. And when the ACC and AHA release recommendation, the guidelines, they use these two different criteria to explain the strength of their recommendations, uh, class one being the strongest level. And then in terms of the level of evidence supporting the recommendations, level A is the highest level of evidence. Coronary CTA was the only non-invasive test to get a 1A recommendation for the diagnosis of coronary artery disease. And FFRCT got a 2A indication for, to guide decision-making for managing coronary artery disease. So let's move into the role of the CT technologist. Coronary CTA with FFRCT has now become the most powerful modality that we have 
for the timely diagnosis of coronary artery disease. And thus, CT technologists are now our frontline troops for detecting dead, the deadliest disease affecting adults worldwide today. But with great power comes great responsibility. FFRCT requires high quality coronary CT images to perform accurate analysis. So there are three core technologist responsibilities in performing coronary CTA. The first is choosing the optimal scan and contrast protocol. Second is collaboration with your CT nurses. And third is engagement with patients during the scan. In terms of choosing the optimal protocol, we really should create separate protocols for handling different types of patients. And we have to mix and match these protocols as needed. For example, with our standard patient, you know, our focus is on the highest rotation speed to maximize temporal resolution. We know that the Achilles heel of coronary CTA and of CT in general is temporal resolution. So by using the highest rotation speed, we maximize temporal resolution and minimize the effect of heart rate. If we have a patient with large body habitus, we wanna reduce rotation speed, increase our tube voltage and increase our contrast injection rate. And by doing so, we improve signal to noise ratio. Now we are sacrificing temporal resolution to do so, so we wanna get the heart rate lower, but that's how we manage these patients with large body habitus. If a patient has high coronary calcium, we wanna increase our tube voltage and use a sharp kernel to reduce calcium blooming. When I started reading coronary CTA 15 years ago, we wouldn't scan patients with a score of over 400. Nowadays in our practice, we don't have a coronary calcium score cutoff. We've scanned patients with scores of 4,000 and still had diagnostic quality images largely due to the benefits of FFRCT. And finally, you know, patients who have irregular heart rhythm, such as atrial fibrillation or frequent premature contractions, we can use techniques such as multi-phase acquisition with temporal padding, or we can trigger in a fixed time delay to work around that. And again, we could have the nightmare scenario where we have a large body habitus patient with high coronary calcium and uh, in a regular heart rhythm like atrial fibrillation, and we have to really combine all these techniques together to get a diagnostic study. Collaborating with our CT nurses is essential. You know, as technologists, the primary goal is to obtain the best image quality in a study that you're performing. Nurses, their primary goal is patient safety, and these are both important goals. And because the medications we use during coronary CTA lower heart rate and blood pressure, close communication is needed to achieve optimal image quality and preserve patient safety. And then engaging with the patient is crucial to getting good images, letting the patient know that they are getting the best non-invasive test available for detecting coronary artery disease. I think you should always lead that point when you first meet the patient. And this is a test that could save their life. This is not an exaggeration. And I think it gives uh, the patients a respect for what you're doing uh, that day. Explain to the patient the importance of lowering heart rate to improve image quality. Make them partners with you when you're performing the scan. Practice the breath hold technique with the patient. And I think it's also important to alert them to specific sensations they can experience during the scan, such as the sound of the CT scanner speeding up before image acquisition, the headache everybody gets after receiving nitroglycerin, and the warmth of power injected contrast. Setting expectations puts the patient at ease. It improves image quality by lowering heart rate and makes for a more pleasant experience. So some take home points. Coronary artery disease remains a number one killer of adults globally. Second, CT technology are gatekeepers for the most powerful tools we have for diagnosing coronary artery disease, coronary CTA and FFRCT. And to use coronary CTA and FFRCT effectively, technologists must identify the best protocol for each patient, collaborate with their nurses for rate control and hyperemia, and engage with their patients during scans. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Calipavito. I love how you appreciate CT technologists. Next up, we have part of the HeartFlow team. We have three folks that will be joining us. First off, we have Karsten Colwell, who has over 20 years of medical imaging experience, and 15 of which he was in a leadership role. Karsten's registered in both CT and MR, with an extensive background in cardiac imaging since 2007. He's both certified and a current member of SCCT. Thanks, Karsten. Thanks, Tara, for that great introduction. Really appreciate it. Hello, everyone. My name is Karsten, and I will review the best practices for acquiring an optimal CCTA. In this slide, you can see how complex things can get, and every single step is important when it comes to achieving an optimal CCTA. Over the next few slides, we will break down each section of the exam workflow. 
From the moment the patient hits the door and to the point of discharge, we will highlight best practices that will ensure overall success. For starters, patient prep at the point of scheduling and while the patient is in the prep bay are critical. As CT technologists, we should work closely with nursing and departmental management in achieving SCCT guidelines of heart rates of less than 60 beats per minute. This will ensure proper protocol selection is applied to not only reduce radiation exposure, but motion artifacts as well. Although heart rate control is one of the focal points of patient prep, we can't overlook the details in patient history, as this will also help us make better decisions on protocol selection, Z axis coverage, and ensuring that the patient leaves with the appropriate study that satisfies both the clinical indication and background. The images in the slide show examples of bypass grafts, surgical clips, and stents that create specific imaging scenarios. Lastly, a set of vitals per the nursing protocol standard procedure. It helps dictate the tolerable amount of beta blockers and nitrates. In conjunction with baseline vitals, the proper size, type, location, IV access will also provide a conduit for optimal image quality as it relates to timing, opacification, clarity, and of course, accuracy. Once the patient has achieved optimal heart rate and all patient prep has been completed, it is now time to ensure we continue to explain the expectations of the test to the patient. Explaining and practicing breathing instructions, the duration of the scan, the warming sensation of the contrast media, and refraining from any body movements should be reviewed extensively. We highly recommend that nitrates be given prior to starting the initial scout topogram to allow time to proper vasodilate and avoidance of reflex tachycardia. That typically happens around the three minute mark. Starting the scan any earlier than five minutes is considered suboptimal timing. Once the patient is on the scanner, proper IV testing with both a hand flush and a power injection is recommended, along with good adhesion of the ECG leads and appropriate placement to maximize signal. And a clean ECG trace is recorded by the scanner. The examples in the slide shows improved vasodilation after five minutes, as well as a consistent and clean ECG trace. Now that it's time to scan, it's important to pay, pay attention to isocentering of the patient as you perform your scalp slash topogram. If a calcium score is performed, it's always a good idea to review the score in detail as it can be used as a guide and preview for Z axis coverage as well as appropriate KV selection. Appropriate KV during the scan acquisition will help reduce calcium blooming and increase diagnostic accuracy. Whether a timing bolus or bolus tracking style is used for contrast monitoring, it is important to ensure that the correct anatomical location is chosen, along with appropriate Hounsfield unit triggering that is built into the protocol to ensure adequate timing has been achieved. After the scan has been completed, it's always a good idea to review your study in multiple planes to evaluate for motion, noise, breathing, misalignment, and that all anatomy has been acquired. Additionally, if image quality and artifacts can be improved with applying different kernels and levels of iterative reconstruction, please apply those features during post-exam review as well. In the images seen here, you can clearly see the calcium borders in a more distinct manner once the sharp kernel has been applied. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karsten. That was great. Next up, we have Sarah Pepping, who's also a senior staff on our CT application group. Sarah's a licensed CT technologist with over 10 years of cardiac CT experience. She's been with HeartFlow for three years, covering the Chicago territory as a senior CT application specialist. Take it away, Sarah. Thanks, Tara and Karsten. Uh, like Tara mentioned, I'm Sarah Pepping. Uh, now that you've completed your scan, let's review the images together to determine if it has optimal or poor image quality. This is an example of a coronary scan with excellent image quality. You can see that there's minimal cardiac or breathing motion because we can confidently follow the lumen of each of the epicardial arteries. And you can see in the LED here 
that there's an amount, a moderate amount of non-calcified plaque, and we can confidently discern that lumen boundary. There's an appropriate uh, contrast timing where the contrast is flush to the right side of the heart, highlighting the left ventricle nicely. You can also see that there's an appropriate amount of radiation dose with minimal noise present. And then also all of the coronary arteries and myocardium is present on the scan. There are several artifacts that you may come across when acquiring the coronary arteries, and I'll walk through the most common. The first being motion. When there's elevated or irregular heart rates, as well as pre patient breathing, this can lead to the motion artifact. You can see here that there's motion uh, in the left main and the LED, as well as the right coronary. And you can identify areas of motion by the dark spots and the blurring around the vessel borders. Similarly to motion, misalignment can occur when there have been irregularities in the patient's heart rate or the patient breathed during scan acquisition. And when this happens, the data set fails to align, and this can occur this can actually cause missing anatomy and it's easiest to view the misalignment in either a coronal or a sagittal view in this example you can see that there's misalignment occurring in the left main also known as the widowmaker and you will want to avoid that break in detector from occurring at this location by ensuring that you don't start your scan too high so if this scan would have started more inferior the misalignment artifact would have occurred more distally, which may have made it a little easier to interpret the scan. Noise artifact can impact the ability to discern non-calcified plaque from artifact. The area circled here is an example of not being able to confidently define the lumen boundary due to the noise artifact. And this can lead to potential overcalling of the disease and can lead to additional testing for the patient. So making sure that you use the optimal KV and MA for the patient size can help mitigate these issues. As well as using post-processing tools such as iterative reconstruction or changing to a, a larger slice thickness can help reduce that noise artifact. And then lastly, here's an example of poor contrast injection and in an ideal contrast distribution. On the left, there's a dense amount of contrast in the right atrium, and it's possibly caused by scanning the patient either too early or injecting the contrast at a low injection rate. And this has caused a streaking artifact into that right coronary, which makes it difficult to discern the lumen boundary of that artery. And then here on the right, the contrast has been flushed through the right side of the heart and is enhanced nicely in that left ventricle along with good opacification in the coronary arteries and aorta. Thank you, Sarah. And last but not least on the heart flow team, we do have someone else coming up after, but last but not least here, we have Amanda Cunningham. Amanda has over 10 years of medical imaging experience, uh, seven of which were dedicated to cardiac CT. She serves North Texas and Oklahoma as a cardiac CT application specialist for heart flow. Go ahead, Amanda. Thank you, Tara, for that introduction. Hi, my name is Amanda Cunningham. Now that we've reviewed the workflow and image quality, let's go over submission requirements specifically for heart flow. As shown are the reconstruction requirements needed for a heart flow analysis. If the recon sent do not meet these minimum requirements, the case will be rejected due to being out of spec. Some key takeaways are, the display field of view must be between 15 to 25 centimeters or 150 to 200 millimeters. Slice thickness will also affect the spatial resolution. Therefore, heart flow requires a, excuse me, a slice thickness of less than one millimeter. Lastly, all heart anatomy must be present for accurate FFR CT calculation and analysis. Moving on to cover patients with metallic stents. If a patient has a metallic stent present in one vessel system, 
as this patient does in the left circumflex, the vessel will be gray in color and no FFR CT value will be provided. The FFR CT will be provided for the other two vessel systems that do not have stents present. Heart flow analysis has been studied in patients with prior PCI, but the FFR values have only been validated in vessels without metallic stents. For this reason, when submitting studies with prior PCI, there are three instances where the case will be automatically rejected. When a, when a metallic stent is present in the left main coronary artery, in the presence of a left main coronary artery stenosis that is greater than 30%, and one or more metallic stents present in the left system. Lastly, when there are two or more vessel systems with stents. Additionally, there are a few other contraindications for FFR CT, such as patients having a previous bypass surgery and certain cases with fistulas. Some fistulas can affect the physiological changes in pressure and flow. For this reason, we cannot process cases with a fistula that is greater than 1.5 millimeters in diameter. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. And last, but certainly not least, we may have saved the best for last. We have Vince Haggard, who's a CT technologist from a prominent large hospital system in Texas. Thanks for joining us, Vince. We can't wait to hear about your real world scenario and how you helped your hospital system. Thank you, Tara, for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vince Haggard. I'm the chief technologist of a radiology department in the North Texas region, part of the greater Dallas area. It's a great privilege to join with you all today as a fellow CT technologist to place emphasis on the CT tech portion of scanning CCTAs and obtaining FFRCT. I've been a registered CT technologist for eight years but have only recently specialized in coronary CTA for the past two years. So thankfully I was introduced to HeartFlow in the beginning of those two years and was really blown away at what information HeartFlow FFR CT can provide for the patient, the provider, and even us as the technologist in the CT suite. Our staff, including myself, uh, had humble beginnings for all that were diving into scanning coronary CTAs. The CCTA world was extremely fascinating uh, to our entire CT team really, and, and we were all even more encouraged and engaged in learning how to better our CCTA program because of the great staff and the, the wonderful relationships built between our department and the staff at HeartFlow. I believe the humble mindset that I mentioned uh, that we started out with uh, and staying in that mindset of that we always have more that we can learn, that mindset has definitely maintained a positive trend in our success in scanning CCTAs. So throughout our cardiac program, we have placed immense focus on chasing quality for the CCTA imaging, not just obtaining decent scans, but actually staying in pursuit of outstanding quality that gets better and better because we as the technologists are getting better and better. Um, we knew nothing about coronary CTA in the beginning. I didn't even know those types of studies were really a thing, but we were excited to learn and we asked lots of questions and we still do to further our knowledge and to get increasingly better in providing quality scans. The drive for myself and other staff to keep gaining in knowledge such as the how and the why we are scanning certain ways has really been key for us in our seeking success. Fine tuning our approach to the scan uh, to be a custom fit for each and every patient, such as the breathing techniques for the patients during the exam, injection flow rates and scanner settings for uh, accommodating patient body habitus, um, obtaining patient surgery history, such as cabbages and how to alter the scan because of that, as well as post-processing and definitely IV placement. These have all been just a few of the contributing factors to our gained knowledge and the confidence we have 
and how we go about each scan. Most everyone wants success. We all want to produce something good, but actually pursuing quality and chasing after that more and more, um, gathering more information for ourselves to make sure that we do not remain stagnant, but rather constantly getting better as the scanning technologist. That has been crucial in our success from knowing nothing to becoming a radiology department that's proudly conducting care and cultivating quality in our imaging that's come to be respected and appreciated by many around us that are receiving these efforts as the patient and also as the ordering offices utilizing these uh, imaging results. So we continually stress the importance of really taking time uh, taking our time with the CCTA patients and having technologists that can be relaxed and patient throughout the, uh, the patient's care um, from beginning to end, uh, the entirety of the, the patient's care here with us. So this, along with keeping communication with the patient on what we're doing for the next step of their care, can be extremely helpful in keeping the informed patient relaxed and helping to keep a lower heart rate and optimal image quality for us this pleasant patient experience that we strive to maintain along with the outstanding image quality has given us a great reputation with both patients and providers where both can be confident in, in uh, returning to us for future care. So with all of this combined, the results and program growth that we've seen has been very exciting and extremely rewarding for us to see. When we first started scanning CCTAs, uh, our image quality passing rate was in the low 80s percentage wise, and we had roughly three to five CCTA patients per week. Two years later, we're now seeing a 99% image quality pass rate with heart flow and 20 to 30 CCTA exams per week. So, and we're steadily increasing that each month. So it's been a giant leap and it's been, a ton of fun for us. So with all of this combined, um, we've had a giant leap like we, like we uh, discussed a moment ago. We've had giant contrast from beginning to end and we're looking to really grow that even further. Um, we're having a lot of fun along the way. It's been amazing to see the importance of the, the quality care and the quality imaging in CCTA and FFRCT to really see that take a hold in our community around us and to see that making a difference, to see our numbers growing and making a difference. And we're thankful to be a contributing force for the cardiac patients and their providers. And we love the difference that we're um, making and seeing the impact that we've been able to share this. And uh, so thank you for the time today to be able to share this with you all. And hopefully this is an encouragement to you that um, to see our humble beginning and uh, that we're trying to stay humble along the way that there's always more and more for us to learn, um, keeping that in mind along the way. So thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. That was great. I think it's uh, what I get most out of that is the fact that you still feel like you have stuff to learn, things to learn. I think CT technologists are a critical role in um, a successful program, so I appreciate you sharing your feedback. We do have a couple questions that have come in, so if our faculty, if Vince, Amanda, if you guys don't mind coming onto camera along with myself, Karsten, and Sarah, that would be great. Uh, I think I'll start with uh, Karsten. Just a quick question. Uh, AFib, is, uh, do you, can this be done in patients with AF? Oh, well, that's a big question. We get that one asked a lot. So the best thing I would say to that is um, overall, no, uh, just because of the, the challenges that you run into with AFib patients. Uh, but really, I mean, it's up to the user. I mean, you can technically submit those, but it all has to do with image quality. That's going to depend on the protocol, uh, how much variability you actually have there on that particular patient. I mean, sometimes patients come in the door and, uh, you know, they're considered an AFib patient, but their heart rate might be stable and regular. And the answer to that patient would be yes. I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you're looking at different things on the protocol and different types of scanners that are out there. 
So we globally say no to that answer, but I don't think that uh, we would we would kind of push back on that, I would say, and say, yes, you can. And it's a case by case basis. So it's kind of a mixed answer there. Awesome. Thank you. That's very helpful. I do have a question for Vince. What was your biggest challenge when you started scanning cardiac and how were you able to overcome the challenge? Hey, thank you for the question. So that probably would be um, just our lack of experience in, in different situations, such as the AFib patient, like you we mentioned a moment ago. Um, the lack of experience and knowing what options and what scanner settings and what decisions can be made in each situation, because every patient is different. Um, Every situation can be different with even uh, several different AFib patients. So uh, just getting used to that and being able to call, so I to call it in different situations and say, we're going to scan it this way. We're going to increase our flow rate. Uh, we're going to take extra time to calm the patient down some, uh, to further calm them down before we begin, uh, before we uh, start with uh, dropping nitro and starting with the scan. So that, just taking time to to really grow in that way and then being patient in the meantime because we wanted the quality in the beginning as well so just being patient with that learning and growing with each experience and then keeping those uh those mental notes as we grow as we grew along the way and then also communicating that amongst the other technologists and saying hey i did encounter this yesterday or i I saw this on my patient a few minutes ago, and this is what we did, and it really helped compared to last time. So mental notes for sure. That's great. Super helpful. A uh, couple more questions are coming in quick. So we have uh, a question that just came in. So maybe I'll go to Amanda. Uh, the Geisinger team wants to know, uh, they wrote, we know to wait at least five minutes for nitroglycerin to take effect. But when does it wear off? How long is too long? Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So yes, definitely you wanna give the nitro and you want it to dissolve. So you wanna wait five minutes after it dissolves. Um, I would say between 10 and 15 minutes is probably when it's um, not taking effect anymore that you can, um, you can always give another one after that if the patient's conditions are all okay and the physician's okay with it. Awesome. And we have another one for Vince. Do you have a separate scanner protocol for uh, large patients? Yes, we do. Um, as was mentioned earlier, um, the increase in KB, the increase in the technique on the scanner um, is a is a big is a big factor in that. Whenever you're uh, taking the larger patient body habitus into consideration. So um, we have a normal or a smaller patient body habitus protocol. And then we also have a larger patient protocol um, as well as a larger patient protocol for uh, arrhythmic patients and smaller patients. So really a, a good group of four different protocols for that but very important, and we teach that all the time, uh, to be mindful of which protocol you're using for, for the patient on the table, because um, as we saw earlier, you can really help avoid the, uh, the noise and the artifact, uh, the suboptimal image quality if you are choosing the correct uh, scan protocol. So it's a big deal. Keep that in mind, and we teach that all the time. That's awesome, and I think that's something, I mean, maybe Karsten, Sarah, or Amanda can chime in. That's something that we we can help support on the heart flow side, and give some guidance uh, if, you, if there are specific scenarios. Okay, perfect. They're definitely the experts, so <laughs> I would rely on them heavily as you can, um, not just for heart flow related things, but also CCTA, um, really just image quality. So um, keep that in mind that we have support. Uh, we do have another question. Maybe I'll address this one to Sarah. Any suggestions for a CT tech who would like to become more involved and or certified on cardiac imaging? Yeah, um, 
Good question. Uh, my first question would be, are you already scanning cardiac at, at your institute? Otherwise, um, taking webinars like this one with the SECT and, and learning more about cardiac, it, it obviously helps when you're hands-on and, and scanning it in, in real life. Um, and if you're a customer of HeartFlow, a lot of times us as CT apps will come on site and do hands-on training. Um, so if you are a HeartFlow, HeartFlow customer, I would reach out to to your local CT apps person and we can always come on site and, and do some more training for you too. Awesome. We have a lot of Nitro questions coming in. So maybe I'll start with Karsten. Uh, do you use 0.4 or 0.8 of Nitro? And have you seen, um, has anyone seen a difference, uh, any differences in the dose? Well, our minimum requirement is 0.4. That will, you know, at least there's some nitrates on board, which is, you know, part of uh, vasodilation that we need to give you, you know, the uh, accurate FFRCT values. But what I would say to that additionally is uh, 0.8 does add uh, a little more clarity as far as further vasodilating distally, which can also change the values of the FFRCT. So we we recommend that uh, we, you know, we, we talk a lot about it when we talk to our uh, customers giving 0.8. Um, we would love for all of our, uh, you know, customers to do that. Um, you know, certain situations arise when the patients can't tolerate 0.8 because of their blood pressure. But uh, long story short, 0.4 is the minimum, but we would really uh, like to see as many uh, customers as possible use the 0.8 just for accuracy and, uh, get, and avoiding discordance, especially uh, when comparing that to an invasive FFR. Awesome. And maybe Vince can chime in on that too and another question <laughs> as well. Uh, does the nitroglycerin timing change when you're using the spray? I don't know if Vince, you want to answer that or if someone from the HeartFlow team would? Uh, I can't really speak to that. I've not used the spray. Okay. Um, but I would like to add, just to piggyback on what we were speaking on a moment ago, yeah, the, the HeartFlow team has been amazing um, and a total key for us with our growth along the way with learning more and more. So we've constantly referenced HeartFlow and gone to HeartFlow um, app, CT apps with all of these questions and more every step of the way. So that also helped with each one of our questions that we had pretty much weekly. So thank you. That's awesome. And then regarding the spray, maybe Amanda, do you have information on that or Sarah? Yeah, I can touch on that. So the spray, you still want to wait five minutes, but the nice thing about spray versus sublingual tablets is you don't have to wait for it to dissolve. Um, so the tablets, you you can give it, but you want to wait after it's dissolved for five minutes, where the spray, you spray it, and you can go ahead and, and set your timer for five. Awesome. So very helpful. And so I want to I wanna be cognizant of people's time. So we have two more questions that I'll go ahead and um, see if we can get answers to, and then we will cut off the questions, but I'll put an email address in, in the chat so you guys can certainly reach out to HeartFlow at any time if you have further questions. Uh, the next question, uh, perhaps Amanda, you can help us with this one. Is there a strict BMI cutoff where CT slash FFRCT truly is not the best test? Thank you, Tara. No, we actually do not have a BMI cutoff. Um, Obviously, we do want to make sure that techniques are scanned appropriately, and then you have the appropriate amount of contrast and um, mass and KV, but we actually don't have a strict BMI cutoff. Perfect. <clears throat> so I think that sometimes is a little um, surprising to hear. I don't, you know, that we have such new scanner technology. Um, we can, there's a lot we can do. Um, then the last question, when getting the return emails, do you prefer we wait to get the recommendation, the recommendation in quotes, uh, email from the HeartFlow tech or start new recons when we get the returned email, which comes first without the recommendations? That's a very specific question, but good to know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, maybe, I don't know who has, uh, Karsten, maybe you can take that one. <laughs> well, our returns team would probably uh, enjoy uh, you resubmitting as quickly as you can. Uh, that does save them some time. Uh, our team on the return side are very knowledgeable. So, um, you know, they're there and for a reason, and, and they'll certainly give you what you need. But if you guys feel, you know, once you we come to your side and you, we've trained you and you've noticed there's a return, and sometimes things are returned for different reasons, right? And there might be an accident. You could return those very quickly. So 
I would my answer to that would be yes if you feel comfortable and confident to go ahead and resubmit those. Um, and a lot of times they'll they'll let let us know that hey this this customer has resubmitted before we got a chance to look at it, which is is not a you know a show showstopper, but it you know it does alleviate some time frame for them. So I would say yes, go ahead and and submit. Awesome. And I, I do see one other question that came in that's really good. So I'm going to go ahead and let Sarah take this one. Any advice for when you have given all the beta blockers you can, IV uh, slash PO, and now blood pressure is low? Um, I think if the question is asking, should you go ahead and scan it or what you should do with the patient? Um, if the blood pressure is low, I would obviously have your nurse and doctor, you know, handle it however they need to handle it. Um, if the question is, should you move on with continuing with the with the coronary, it would all depend on what the heart uh, heart rate is at that time. Um, and if the physician feels, and the scanner that you have, and if the physician feels like you can move forward with, with the test. So it, it's a hard question to answer when there's a lot of variability, uh, variables on that one. Yes, we certainly are. Um, so any last thoughts maybe from um, any of the CT app folks or Vince, anything else that you just want to add? You guys are good. Okay, awesome. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank thank you. you so, yes, thank you so, so much for all, all of you guys for all your hard work and your dedication. And uh, thank you Vince for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have you here with us and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thanks for being here.